In the spring of 1991, I came across an album called Spiderland by the group Slint. There wasn't much information on the front sleeve. Neither the band name or the album title appeared. Just a black and white photograph of four guys floating in a quarry. It's a very singular record and felt personal. It kind of seemed like it created its own world and wasn't like other music that I'd heard up to that point. I started asking around if anyone knew who was behind that record or what was going on and found out that the band had actually broken up before it was released. You would hear stories that the band had had a nervous breakdown while recording or couldn't get along with each other or had gone into seclusion, but you never knew what to really believe. Anytime I heard rumors that some combination of the guys from Slint might be performing, I would drive up to Louisville from Athens, Georgia to go explore it, bringing cameras with me and shooting footage when I went. It never turned out to be true. Sometimes when I would go visit, I would end up at bizarre house parties in strange buildings that seemed like they were half collapsing, where there were desiccated chickens nailed up to the wall with strings going through them like a puppet, while some noise band played. Outside one of these shows, the drummer Britt Walford actually approached us, trying to find his friend Steve Good. My friend and I kind of froze up. Steve Good. I haven't seen him. Did you get him? Yes. <laughs> Great. Over the years, I came to know the band members and began piecing together this film about the Louisville culture they'd grown up in and how they'd made the record Spiderland. At some point as um, a kid, I was just bored of rock. And right after that is when I met Brian. Britt had been there from the beginning. And I recall kind of gradually sort of gaining access to like this group of people that seemed to be thinking some interesting stuff. This is the Brown School, nine floors straight up in the heart of downtown Louisville. It's not only the physical structure and the location that make the Brown School unique, but the people inside, the students and teachers, they know the most about this uniqueness. 1980, I think, would have been the year that Britt and I met. And it would have been uh, when I enrolled at uh, the Brown School. It was sort of a small, experimental public school. It treated the kids more like they were adults. It definitely like encouraged uh, creativity and this sort of group, sort of collaborative setting. But you know, other than just sort of like hallway shenanigans, I'd be hard pressed to say what exactly we achieved. <laughs> they were inseparable. I was not sure Brian wasn't a, a, one of the members of the family here a lot of the times because. I mean, he, Brian yeah, was. they were. Well, they, they were, were both. Thick. They were both very intense. <laughs> Britt and Brian went to school together since they were little kids, and they have kind of an insulated, kind of a sense of humor that they developed on their own. People kind of, I think, they feed off it. They think somehow that it applies to them sometimes, that it's a joke that only they're in on. Well, now, now you're not in on the joke, you know. I mean, a lot of the times, nobody knows what the fuck they're, they're communicating like this with weird rays coming out of their eyes to each other, you know? I mean, I've known them for 25 years or something. I don't know what they're fucking laughing at half the time. When I was in high school, my friend Kathy used to refer to the two of them as the baby hardcores because we couldn't differentiate between them. 
Britt was a true night owl. And I mean, he would be sitting there on the phone talking to Brian at 2 a.m. in the morning. Our parents took us to this show and it was in like a abandoned hotel. And um, it was, you know, just really crazy to us because we were really little and just like, I guess, intimidated, but it was really, had a really good feeling. We did a hardcore matinee on a Sunday. This would have been the fall of 82. And Langwood and Flaccid opened for us, which was Britt and Brian's first band. Ned was the eldest member of the band at 13 at that time. I think Britt was 11. I remember the guys in Malignant Growth, who were quite a bit older than me, like leaning on against the wall, laughing and pointing because uh, Ron Walford and Joe Oldham were, were carrying the amps in because the, you know, Britt and Brian and Ned were too small to lift their own gear. You'd see Britt and Brian and they were just like little kids standing around with terrifying giant skinheads and weird dudes in dresses. It was fucking heaven. When I was in Meyer Threat, <clears throat> we were touring in 1983, we were touring out west. And the last show we played actually was in Newport, Kentucky, just across the river from Cincinnati, and we played with Malignant Growth, and they were phenomenal. So I had some inkling that there was something happening here, and I felt an affinity with the Louisville kid. I just felt like they were, they were coming from a, a really real place. Louisville had a remarkable regional hardcore and punk scene, beginning around 1978 with No Fun, and followed by The Eye Holes, Dick Brains, Babylon Dance Band, The End Tables, The Blinders, Your Food, Skull of Glee, and malignant growth. I don't remember how Languid and Flaccid ended, but then Brian formed a band called Maurice with a couple other guys. Maurice really was basically those guys being very uh, kind and indulgent to me because I wanted to be in a band and they had already been in one and they had equipment they wanted, you know, they were, they were interested in, in doing some stuff, but they were, they were, they, they were just really cool to just let me do it with them. Me and Ned met him at uh, the Beat Club at uh, Malignant Growth Show, and it was just really great to meet him because he was so cool. I guess he got his uh, nickname Rat. Originally, they called him Mad Rat because he kind of had this, like, shimmy dance, you know, but it was really fast, and people said that he looked like a mad rat dancing. You know, he was from the South End, too, and that kind of made him extra exotic, I guess. There are really two kind of divergent Louisville punk rock histories that came together. There were the East Enders who, from the South End redneck point of view, were more privileged and artier. And then there was the South End, the kind of the more working class redneck part of town. My best friend Mike at the time was playing bass with them, so I, would, I started going to their practices, and that was when I was first like getting into punk rock and stuff. And I remember being really scared by, at their practices because I'd never seen anyone play drums like Britt, because he was only 14 and he was just thrashing. And the singer would go to practices, but he wouldn't sing. He would just like, he would just sort of rock back and forth and pull his hair out and scream and stuff. And I, I was like, <laughs> this is punk rock. I don't know if I like it. At that time, Britt was playing drums in Squirrel Bait, and it was a three-piece. It was David and Clark and Brett. It's weird thinking about how you passed your time when you were 14 years old. Hardcore was our moment, and yet we just couldn't help but ridicule it and be utterly sarcastic about it. So Squirrel Bait began with this joke that uh, it was going to be uh, a band called Squirrel Bait Youth, because there were all of these hardcore bands with youth in their name. And you know, Squirrel Bait was just like dumb Louisville slang for nuts. Nuts like crazy or nuts like testicles or what? Oh, nuts like crazy. Squirrel Bait, I guess they 
had some new songs and then I started playing with them and they came over and we practiced these songs and played for a while and then recorded and um, I played a show with them at the Jockey Club. David had been singing up until that time uh, and they had decided that he would just not do as a singer. Um, and I, I practiced with them for a little while and then they quickly decided that I would just not do as a singer and they found Peter and uh, it worked out much better for them. But around the time that they added Peter, Brian also joined a band of Squirrel Bait. It was about a year or two before they re-recorded or, or re-recorded some stuff recorded again with a different drummer and made their first record. Squirrel Bait shows were really weird in this town. It was like a total, like, it was like a college scene. Going to a Squirrel Bait show was like hanging out with like U of L fraternities. Britt had told David and Clark that he didn't want to play in the band anymore. He wanted to devote his time to Maurice, I, as I understood it. We had to have a guitar player because Brian wanted to be in Squirrel Bait all the time, and Brian was very sick of me. Britt calls me on the phone one day, he's like, listen to this. And he puts the phone down and Paul is playing with them. And he, he walked in, he, he already knew the set. He might have only been playing guitar for two years or something, but he would like practice like nine hours a day in the summertime. You couldn't, you couldn't really do anything to it. Like you couldn't bang your head to it, you couldn't slam to it, because it, the thrash parts would only be for like 30 seconds and they'd go into an incredibly slow part. It's like, you know, slant but fast. It was, it was unbelievable. I mean, they're one of the great lost bands, you know, certainly of Louisville, if not the country. My mother drove Brett and Brian and Sean and myself to Bloomington to see Sam Hain play on their first tour. We hung out with Glenn for a while afterwards, uh, pestering him with questions, and Rat did most of the pestering, and they really struck up a friendship that night that continued for a decade. It was that friendship that led Glenn Danzig to invite Maurice to open for them on tour. How old do you think you would have been when you did that Sam Hain tour? I think 14. You know, when they walked in the room, it was like, oh shit. But then, you know, we just got really comfortable with them, I guess. It was the one and only time they ever played, outside of the state, at least. Will Oldham actually went along with them, too, um, just for the hell of it. This guy named Kevin Mitchell, drove us because I guess he could rent the van. Oh man, he was like the worst driver, like not very, not very practical in any sense. <laughs> I don't guess his eyes are crossed sometimes, but he, he would just have his eyes like barely open when he was driving and then he'd start falling asleep and like veering and be like, Kevin, like what? <laughs> we got there, didn't we, idiot? I can't even believe that we managed to tour, like convince our parents that we should leave on tour, like at that age, I don't know, like how it happened or anything. It seemed like Dave was writing some stuff that Sean was just like, wow, he's, you know, coming from a different place or something. I mean, I was raised on country music and, and uh, you know, like Elton John records. So I was always looking for the song. And if it didn't have a real catchy chorus or something, I. I, just, I couldn't wrap my head around it. 
just from listening to the Minuteman a lot, I got really into um, clean guitar sounds. And Maurice was a pretty ab abrasive band, and we, you know, suddenly we were doing this stuff that was kind of like kind of dorky and clean. The last Maurice song is a song they played last night. Now I don't know what the slant name of it is, but it's a Maurice song, and I remember hearing it and just being like, I can't do a fucking thing with this. basically just broke up, but Britt and I had these songs that we wanted to work on, and that's when um, uh, I started talking to Ethan, who was my best friend at the time. I was the oldest, and I was, I guess, about 18, and I think Britt was still about 16. He said he wanted to form a band that was completely different from anything else at the time. I told him that Britt, Britt was kind of into, the, into the same thing, that maybe they should meet. You know, all of these slint songs, began down there under the floor. There's a camera up here. Does anybody want this? Is this broke? Oh. No thanks. Okay, all right. I guess uh, guitar, like Brian's guitar over there and Dave's guitar and the bass. Did you uh, know that it was raining? Would be Did you know that it was raining? like right here, the drums over there. Britt's parents were great. Maurice practiced there, Scorbe practiced there. When Slint formed, they practiced there. They were just always super tolerant and cool about all the weird stuff going on down there. I think they really wanted to provide like a, you know, sort of like a safe harbor or whatever. And I don't think I ever witnessed any sort of behavior that was motivated in an attempt to like shut us down or say, hey, that's not cool. I think that we were smart enough to kind of know what lines needed to be maintained. Of course, we had an outside door to the basement, so they would go yeah. in and out. And, you know, many times I wouldn't know if there were three down there or 12. I remember being over there uh, one day, I guess it was uh, Ron's birthday, and I, I remember, like, you know, Britt, like, yelling up at his dad, like, hey, Dad, listen to this. You know, it's the song Ron for Ron's birthday, and that was kind of really cool. You know, it's like, sounds good, Britt. <laughs> Britt's dad is a piano player. One time we were practicing, and then when we were done practicing, we could hear the piano upstairs, and he was playing the song on the piano. Originally, we wanted Will to sing and play guitar, and um, he hadn't been in a band at that point. He came to a practice, and we sort of tried him out, but he only knew um, like a couple of chords. He was just learning how to play guitar. When we played our first show, he, he showed up, but he, he didn't sing or do anything. He just like sat in front of the kick drum and held it in place. <laughs> this is the program from our first show as um, a band, uh, actually before we were called Slint. Ethan's dad is a Unitarian, so and they, they were doing a lecture on rock and roll music, so they, they were like, you know, Ethan's son has a band, a rock and roll band, maybe they should play. I was very uncomfortable because I thought, oh my goodness, you know, these people, are they going to appreciate this or understand it or are they going to... I, I was uncomfortable that night. Do you remember, do you remember that performance? It was during a service, wasn't it? Daytime. The service begins with greetings, announcements, lighting of the chalice and then music, rock and roll music by small, dirty, tight tufts of hair beads. It was funny too because the, the, the uh, sermon or the speaker was, it was on mysticism. I remember, you know, we, we started the first song and there was just old ladies like, and like kids crying. Dave had a full stack and you know, it was like pretty many people just got up and, and left, like, kind of stoically, just like, because <laughs> they were, you know, it was just really loud.
you think that Brian might have been at that show and seen it and liked it? Yeah, Brian Brian came to it and uh, I I think he recorded on micro cassette. Um, yeah, and he really and he he just seemed like he really liked the band and and uh, he started playing. I'd say for Tweez, um, I joined the band after at least half that material was written. Most of it was Brit. You know, Brit would, Brit would sort of come up with the foundations for the songs, and then uh, and then Dave Pajo and Brian would would add parts on top of that. I mean, Brit was just a huge part of the band. He was involved in it, in every every aspect of it. You know, he would help me like with my guitar sound or like settings on my pedals or something. Even a song like Rota, where the whole end of the song is just harmonics, like that, that's something I never would have thought of. What are harmonics? Um. It's like you hit the string at a certain point and um, Man, it's like when you you don't um, you don't fret the note like uh, like you do with a normal chord or whatever you uh, hit the twelfth fret and the seventh and the fifth. Yeah, just kind of it's just another way to mess around. Do you remember where the band name Slint came from? I didn't I know, know that I know until recently. From. Yeah. I mean, I guess at a the fish. at the the yeah. tour, and I said I don't remember a fish named Slint. You know, maybe I forgot about it. That was like just the name of one of my fish, but it was just a word, like, I made up. Britt had every pet you yeah, can imagine, snakes and There's you name it. There's a snake loose in this there, house yeah, right now. We, we never we, found, we never found a snake. <laughs> That's what Ethan and I used to do a lot, is go to pet stores, like, we would go to two or three different pet stores, like, like about twice a week, <laughs> and just, you know buy fish or whatever. When I worked at the pet store, Britt would always come in and ask me like about combining all these weird different kinds of fish and animals together, you know, can you can you put newts in with guppies, you know, stuff like that. He's pushing the women on the interspecies relations. He was at one time kind of a genius for mischief. He had a, a brand of mischief that was all his own and he was just brilliant, you know? And, and no matter what happened around us, no matter what hell they were raising or what s silly stuff we were doing, he would just never, ever, he's just never easily scared. Uh, I remember Britt would, uh, they had a terrific act where Britt would lead Brian. Brian would pretend like he was severely retarded. I mean severely. <laughs> oh, gosh. And, and just sort of a blubbering black basket case. And then Britt would, uh, abuse him, you know, and yank him along like it was his brother or something like that out in public. It was pretty, like, liberating actually being around him just because he just didn't seem to have, like, many inhibitions. And I think I definitely, like, needed that. <laughs> A lot, a lot of in jokes, a lot of in jokes, which was, you know, I was used to that, you know, because I think that's tribal, and I actually, um, I appreciate the tribal factor, um, but their in jokes were just very, um, they were sharp. They were just like a little cruel. Some of their in jokes, I think, and just a lot of s smack was being talked. Uh, but specifically, I remember um, being in the room and somebody farted and there was this um, everyone jumped up and was running to touch a doorknob or something like that and I just sat there and they said oh if you don't touch a doorknob like the last one touches the doorknob gets punched and I said fucking punch me punch me and see what happens God don't play that shit <laughs> they were just crazy they were kids but they were really crazy and I could tell that there was a really the intensity of that um that town, like, the energy was really crazy because it turned out, as I have to find out later on, the people in Louisville are just fucking crazy, right? They're just insane. 
I remember they played the Battle of the Bands at my high school. took like an hour and a half to set up. I mean, people were just bitching and moaning and complaining like, who do these people, who do these kids think they are? They're taking an hour and a half to set up at a battle of the bands. It's a good like template for uh, like our entire career <laughs> that, that video just because it's um, you know we did spend a lot of time tuning in between songs. Britt was a really big fan of Big Black. We all were, and uh, Steve Albini was a producer, and uh, some other bands that we knew of were uh, had been recording with him too. So we wanted to record with Steve Albini. Steve agreed to do it, and he was working a lot at Studio Media in Evanston, and so. That's where we did it. Steve hadn't met Ethan before. I just remember when we first drove to his house from Louisville as a housewarming gift, Britt and Brian had bought him a shotgun that they got at a pawn shop. And uh, we showed up really, really late because uh, for one reason or another. And so it was like late at night and <laughs> we, we hid in the bushes or hid in the van or something and had Ethan go to his front door with the shotgun he would never met and like, we told him just to ring the doorbell, and when he opened the door, just aim the shotgun at him and bug your eyes out. <laughs> and he did it. <laughs> and uh, I remember Steve just slammed the door and as soon as he saw Ethan, and then there was like 30 second pause, and then he opened the door and was like, come in. <laughs> For kids, like they were teenagers, they were kids, they were phenomenal musicians. Like Pajo was a really accomplished guitar player already. And, and uh, Britt was a, a, a really great drummer in terms of like having uh, an internal clock that allowed him to like sort of roll through a bunch of stuff like regardless of what was happening around him he could sort of you know keep his shit together and they were all very conscious of the sound of their instruments like that was a really that was a really big thing for them had a bunch of long conversations with Brit like they were really satisfied with the demo cassettes that they were making in their basement he gave me a, a few specific things that he wanted to do that would be different from those demo recordings. I remember one thing was, Britt was really into the idea that his bass drum should sound like someone slapping a ham. I feel like that, that those songs were pretty much ready, although, like, I, I guess the vocals, like, we had never done or something, like... When we got there, we decided we, want, we wanted to have some vocals, and Brian wanted to do, do some vocals. So what we did was, uh, Steve Albini would do stuff like uh, just have a microphone in the room and we'd talk and have a conversation. For the first song we had like two mics swinging back and forth and um, you know Brian broke a broke a bottle on the floor and we recorded that or we he would just like st like start doing the music stand and like trying to dent it and you know we just did all kinds of stuff. Or we'd write down words that that we thought were funny or that Brit thought were funny. That's why you get those uh, sequences of words you know like snatch feast and tweezer fetish and he'd make a, a loop of it and it'd go around in a loop you know before they had like digital loops it was just a real loop. One of the coolest things about that first Slint record um, was the the way they kind of 
bridged from song to song with like random noises. My friend Mary Oliver was going out with Will in high school and she said there's a cassette called the Anal Breathing Cassette which is like Brian and Britt and a couple other people like trying to blow in and out as much air out of their ass as possible. But then I've also heard that the the noises, the very quiet noises on tweez right before the pass me the goddamn tweezers are part of like home recordings of them taking a shit. We never did talk about the sort of noises that are going on on tweez. Mm -hmm. And you said you might be willing to talk about that. Uh, which part of tweez? The sort of sounds that might be someone like taking a shit or something. Man, you have to put you saying that in the movie. Do you want to talk about the sort of recording tapes that they made? Have you heard those at all? The what tapes? The sort of anal breathing cassette. Have you heard about that? Mm, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Man, I, I don't I don't know. I don't want to comment on that stuff. Do that position again. Oh, okay, hold it. 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 Like <laughs> Is there a story about you trying to destroy the tape at some point? I think, yeah, there was like an afternoon where Britt had begun playing one of the anal breathing tapes on the Tark bus. I think I remember just sort of not being in the mood for it. Oh. <laughs> Man, this should not be. This should not exist. I probably found that pretty inspiring as far as like what we do in this, like intimate bodily recordings. Well, we rec we recorded the record without uh, without really knowing how we we're gonna release it, and I think we we could really hope to be on Touch and Go, and we made a a little demo that we we sent to him that had, there was no response or, or there wasn't much reaction about it. A friend of ours. Jennifer Hartman just like was like, what? You want to put out a record? I'll put out a record. Super nice girl. I remember her like being very supportive and very helpful with the Slint guys. And she certainly took it on the chin making that record. Like she'd never done it before, didn't know how to do it, spent a bunch of her money and, you know, all for the love of it. You know, I, I have nothing but respect for her. There's a beautiful winding road in Louisville called Rose Island Road that we were very fond of back in high school. Uh, we were very fond of riding it, meaning we'd go out there and drive it as fast as we dared. Britt and Brian had this conception for what they wanted the cover to look like. It was just like, take a picture of the front of a Saab on like Rose Island Road or like a road where there's trees and stuff. Joe Oldham took that picture. Oh, yeah. We, we went out on some godforsaken road in the county somewhere, I don't remember where, and blocked the road off. I mean, you know, we weren't allowed. I mean, there, we had no right to do this. We just blocked access to it. And then is that Willie the driver's seat? It is, yes. He's wearing a crash helmet, I believe. At the time, Slint recorded this record. I was working at a photo lab. I had to remove the name Saab off of the grill and remove the um, license plate, the characters in the license plate. And then I can't remember if they superimposed Slint on that at the print shop or if I did that. I think I may have made the negatives to do that as well. I don't remember. They wanted to put the names of our parents as the titles of the song. The yeah, I think all the parents were surprised. Yeah. That. I don't know that any Carol of us knew it. I'm not Aunt sure they McMahon, had names. You know, Did they have would... names for those songs before they had to put, had to commit them to print? Just, I think, I think, I thought it would be funny just because I was thinking of that song Charlotte and then just imagining like, you know, my mom and <laughs> like that's her song. <laughs>
I mean, when I listen to Tweez now, it does sound like it's way more processed than it probably needed to be in terms of there being like extra sound added and stuff. Ethan just hated it uh, once he got home and, and started listening to it and tried in vain to convince them to scrap it and re-record. But at the time, it was a lot of people wanted to do stuff like that. You know, sort of like, uh, I don't know what you call it, like pig fuck punk rock kind of stuff. All those bands, you know, like uh, Killdozer, Jesus Lizard, and you know, there was a lot of that kind of stuff was really popular. I actually feel bad about, I know Ethan sort of personally blamed me for not liking the way that first Slint record came out. And I can't argue with him. I mean, I'm, it's quite likely that I was, uh, you know, cockier than I need, needed to be or than was warranted. And it's quite likely that I was more, like, sort of encouraging this, like, extraneous material. Keep in mind, I was only 19, so I was like, you know, I'd get a lot more passionate about stuff than I do now, back then. But I didn't like the way the recording sounded, and I didn't like uh, what Steve Albini did to it. And uh, I, I thought I kind of got screwed up a little bit, so. I decided I was going to quit. You just, there just wasn't anything like it. I mean, I guess it's cliche, but it's just true. Like, nobody sounded like that. That's where the river bends. That's where the sorrow stands. That's where it may bow. I think literally my neighbor, like we were like cutting grass or something and he came over and said, you need to listen to this. This band is from here. And um, I really couldn't believe that there would be people who weren't much older than me that were able to do music like that. Todd Brashear had been in this hardcore band I was in called Solution Unknown. That he was playing guitar with them, and he was just a, a huge Slint fan. He recorded it on 4-track, our, our show, when we opened for Big Black. When Ethan quit, I guess I kind of let it be known that I would be interested in taking his place if they wanted to let me try or whatever. After they had put out Tweez, they did a short tour, mostly of the East Coast, to generally small confused audiences. As if we didn't stand out enough already, you know, driving in a flat black van across the country with a bunch of freaks in it or whatever. We're probably lucky, really, that nobody killed us on that tour due to these signs that were made and then hung in the back of our van while we were going on this tour. One time, we're in a rest area and a guy came in and made one of us go out and take it down. Well, we didn't take it down. I'm pretty sure we did. No, that was when we got pulled over by a cop. It was, you know, three years between when Tweez was recorded and Spiderland was recorded. Um, so a lot happened in those three years. After Tweez, Britt and Brian were going to Northwestern. Each went because the other was going there and because they had friends there. Our friend Clark Johnson, who was in Squirrel Bait, was at Northwestern at the time. They somehow or another endure each other. Uh, and, and that poor girl who lived there is the third wheel. Uh, I don't know how she oh, ever survived. Oh, I think survived. she could hold her own. I met Brian McMahon our freshman year. Brian was like all set to move off campus his sophomore year, and so I was like, oh, maybe I could do that with you. I think it was pretty unusual that anyone lived off campus their freshman year like Brit, but like, that's Brit. Like the just whatever population of students just kind of blew my mind, really. I, 
really was, I didn't know people like that kind of existed, I guess. It was just weird. We really weren't part of the like campus community. I guess other than maybe being kind of part of like kind of a freakazoid subculture or like subsect or whatever. Their peer group was definitely older than them. I think they had processed all the stuff that they were supposed to get out of being a teenager like fairly quickly. They still had a like a, a prankster kind of mentality, which was which a lot of us who had not grown the sort of prankster mentality kind of appreciated. Particularly with Brit, um, we almost immediately made this connection. I was really impressed with his imagination and uh, the weird turns that his brain takes and the way he thinks about things. Britt and I and Corey built Corey's office in the old Touch and Go building. And uh, one day we were working on framing up the office and Britt and I had gone to 7-Eleven and he had a big gulp or a Coke or something. And a little while later, you know, it had melted and it was just kind of watery. And so I was done with the cigarette and I threw it in there. And he went to take a drink, and he went, oh, man, why, why would you do that? And uh, I said, sorry, I thought you were done. So we kept working and, you know, doing stuff. And uh, later I had a Coke, and I went to take a drink of it. And he had dumped it out and taken a shit into it and put the straw back. And uh, I laughed really hard. Any truth to the idea that the Jesus Lizard song Mouth Breather was in any way reference to Brit? Completely. <laughs> I don't rem really remember where I was, but I was gone for an extended period, and Britt was house-sitting for me. I lived in a bungalow on the north side, and I don't know if Britt had ever lived alone in a house before. I don't know if he knew sort of how a house worked, but fairly early in the occupation, he locked himself out, so he kicked the front door in and then, uh, and then nailed the front door shut with a two-by-four and he would do all of his coming and going through a window in the attic. And like he would go up to the attic and climb out the window and then hop down on the porch and then out. And then he would get back in through the, and that was the same way the cat got in and out of the house. And something else went wrong with, uh, with the kitchen or the bathroom. Something overflowed and was leaking and Steve had his studio down in the basement and uh, it, was, it rained pee water down in the basement. And I actually think I was relaying this story to David Yao at one point, uh, and I was complaining about the uh, the state of my house and what had happened on that trip. And I said, and I literally said, don't get me wrong, he's a nice guy, I like him just fine, but he's a mouth breather. There was this bar called Leader's Liquors that was two or three blocks from where Steve lived. I think a lot of my memories of Brit are like sitting at the bar in Leaders, and the first time I ever really sort of got to know him better was like talking to him all night at Leaders one night, and I remember coming away just going like, uh, what an interesting odd kid he is. <laughs> he was just uniquely different than anyone else I was hanging out with at the time, and it was especially interesting because he was several years younger than everyone else. It was that sort of indescribable Louisville quality that, that Slint are the core of, I think. I think the rumor at the time was that he, was, he could hypnotize girls by staring at them. That was a believable rumor. Started hanging out with um, Clark Johnson's younger brother, Ben. Still felt kind of like, um, I don't know like a little apart or something, but not like it bothered me or anything. <laughs> in high school, uh, some friends of mine, um, we were in a band and we drove up to Chicago to see uh, Bastro play and we stayed with Brian and Britt. And it just seemed like such weird opposites, you know, like Brian's quietness and, and hospitality and then Britt was just so wild. I mean, I remember that night, like, you know, we were kind of celebrating and Britt turns on the Digits album and then turns on a strobe light and is playing with this hunting knife all night, you know, and we're kind of like, oh, we've been driving, let's go to bed. And like, it's just like rock and roll at volume 11, complete with strobe light and this huge survival knife. And he's kind of like picking his fingernails with it. You know, I mean, they were like cartoonishly opposed, like quiet Brian and then just totally manic, wild-ass Brit. 
they had at some point used plywood to basically create a third bedroom just by like framing out like a crude wall like kind of like diagonally through the center of the living room and uh, that was Brit's bedroom uh, uh, it was really dark inside Brian's bedroom was this very um, very tidy I think he had some house plants um, it was uh, it faced onto the alleyway but it was still kind of light and open and um, uh, just uh, well put together like Brian is and then and then Britt's bedroom was, uh, you know, had this huge iguana cage and, uh, you know, his bed on the floor. And, uh, and um, it was just, the, you know, these, these two personalities that are both really part of Slint. In the spring of 1989, Steve Albini recorded two more songs with the band, which would go unreleased until 1994. I had been approached by a band and booked some studio time at Chicago Recording Company and that band canceled. So I was looking at having to pay for these studio sessions. So I called a bunch of my friends' bands, basically like, hey, I'm stuck here. I have the studio time booked. Uh, do you guys want to do a session? And that's when Slint came up and did the two song session that ended up coming out as the 10 inch. I had dropped out of school, but Britt, Dave, and Todd were all still in school um, and in different places. They were more patient with themselves by then. Um, yeah, I think they were willing to let ideas develop a little bit longer before moving on from one idea to another, even either within a song or like just in life, I guess. <laughs> you know? That was just so radically different than Tweez and uh, and, in, and in a way that was immensely appealing to me. I remember getting a tape of that and just listening to it over and over really fucking loud. I don't think that we really had um, like a focused objective necessarily like when we, when we did the recordings uh, as far as release. I think we're just trying to take advantage of the, the studio time. And also, I think, trying to seize the moment maybe to like kind of spark or regain some momentum with the band. Just trying to like refocus like energy. I definitely saw them noodling and more so Brit. And sometimes he was just like really annoying and not very considerate that there might be other people living in his apartment with the noise he made. Basically, Brian had his guitar amp and his guitar there, and so I would just play that. And he had a, a classical, too, that maybe he played on, but we never really played together. I know they had a guitar with, that was always plugged into an amp in, like, their living room, and that became, like, um, you know, like, it's, it's, for me, when I would go visit him, it, it, it seemed like that was, like, where they would just, like, anyone could just pick it up and sit down and like come up with ideas and, and Britt had a little tape recorder to save him and that's where like songs like Nosferatu Man got written. One night um, I had, uh, had been out and came back at like um, like I don't know like two in the morning and Britt was um, hunched over his guitar and playing uh, Rachmaninoff little piece over and over. It was like you know a three or four second little clip and he'd play it, rewind it, play it, rewind it. And then he'd work on the guitar for a little bit and uh, I think he did that for hours, you know. I went to bed and he, I think, continued to do that for hours and hours. I was like, yeah, that's cool, but like, I'm not gonna go see him or anything. I was into my own stuff, like, just video camera, I'd take video camera to slant practice. Throw it. After that year of college, 
we all came back to town and then just worked on those songs. <laughs> just five days a week at Britt's house in the basement. We would just start off with something and then add things and, you know, build a song kind of um, like, you know, one part at a time. The way the writing process was is if some one person had a riff, they would play that riff till the end of time, basically while somebody else was trying to write other parts. Yeah, it made for some really interesting and sort of hypnotic uh, rehearsals. which is kind of crazy. To, I mean, we were all in, we were all kind of out of our minds or something, you know what I mean? Like just that we we definitely had a certain mindset to be able to sit there and do that for that long. It was really cool, like, because after we got into it, um, practicing, like the more we did it, the more I enjoyed it. <laughs> So I like kind of just like sneak down the back steps and enter the way I normally did because I was welcome. And uh, you know, I came in and had this Nosferatu shirt on and they just stopped playing. Like Britt just drops the sticks and he's like, Brian. You know, so they start playing this song again and and uh, I'm just, you know, kind of standing there or sitting there or something listening to it and afterwards they're like, man, what'd that make you think of, John? And I said, it, I, I feel like a monster on an airplane. <laughs> and they're like, okay. My lone experience in seeing Slint was my high school band, this, this kind of loud, hard rock band, um, had, our, had a show booked in Chicago at Club Dreamers and they played and it was completely packed. And I just remember seeing like Albini and all of these like super swaggery tastemaker dudes just like completely silent. This was the first time I'd ever seen a show where nobody was talking and that everybody was hanging on to every note and the band did not move a muscle. <laughs> Thank you. 
they played at a place called the Kentucky Theater. And once again, it was sort of deliberately not a spectacle. There were a couple floor lamps, you know, no big production or anything. They played all instrumental uh, versions of many of the songs that came out a month or two later on Spiderland. And it was the first time that I had heard what they'd been up to uh, over the course of the last year. And I imagine the first time almost everyone in attendance had heard it. And we were all stunned by what we heard. You just watched it year after year. They would get more, there was something, they were planning something, they were, you could see it in Britt's head. He was just like, I had this idea and it kept coming out and he'd sit and play guitar and come up with these riffs and you're like, what the fuck is that? There was sort of more of a traditional songwriting element that was starting to, to be in, incorporated in our stuff and, um, uh, and not, not in the sense that we we're gonna start doing folk music, but that it was, it was like, it, like the songs became stories. I started thinking about lyrics like early and when the songs were developing. Although everybody else didn't necessarily hear the ideas until later on, we were like pretty loud. So it didn't really lend itself to doing these like spoken vocals in this tiny room with like Britt's huge drums and Dave's like full stack. We would record our rehearsals in the basement, and I would do uh, four-track vocals on top of them, largely in my parents' car in uh, the garage. When he woke, there was no trace of the ship. Only the dawn was left behind by the storm. Inside of a garage in Louisville, um, with headphones on, like in, in a closed car with the windows up, um, going like listening over to these songs and trying to figure out how it's gonna do the phrasing and stuff. breadcrumb trail just musically with how that song is structured it seemed to uh, suggest itself as sort of this uh, like maybe sort of like loss of innocence sort of thing it was one of the last songs for me to I think complete lyrics uh, before going into the studio so um, I think I was more uh, aware of the the album sequence at that point. I pulled back the drape thing on the tent. There was a crystal ball on the table behind it, a girl wearing a hat. We wanted to do a really straightforward recording, even if the songs weren't were kind of more abstract, the, the production would be really straightforward, almost like, um, I don't know, I think it's really inspiring that some of my favorite records were, were just done up with one mic and one guy with a guitar stomping his feet, you know? After doing two recordings uh, with Steve, whom we, you know, greatly respected and had an awesome relationship with, and, uh, um, I, I think that, I think we felt that, um, that we wanted to just like work with somebody else. In 1990, Brian McMahon drove towards Madison, Wisconsin, where David Grubbs' group Bastro was recording Sing the Troubled Beast at Smart Studios. 
Brian Paulson was engineering the recording. On the way, McMahon saw a stranded motorist on the side of the road and pulled over to help them. Brian was struck by an oncoming car and sent flying into the side of his own vehicle, where he made an impression in the shape of his body. He bounced off and flew through the air, coming down on his head. The witnesses present thought that Brian had been killed. Brian was loaded into an ambulance and driven towards a hospital. The first indication that he was actually conscious came after the paramedics used a medical code 138. And with his eyes still closed, Brian began to repeat, We are 138. We are 138. Brian recovered from his injuries, and the group settled on Brian Paulson to record Spiderland. Brian Paulson had done some recording with Bastro, as well as recording some Minneapolis-based stuff that we had all heard and liked. I guess my motive at that point in time was to record things as just purely as possible and kind of um, let things unfold as they unfold and not try to get in the way of things that would happen naturally. Touch and Go had agreed to put it out. Corey had seen us perform some of the material and uh, I guess I had worked at the studio where we recorded and so I got a discount so the money went a little further. Brian was working at River North Recorders at that point in time so we could get in there for you know, a pretty decent rate uh, over the week like you know late night weekend sort of scene. I think we recorded the whole thing in one weekend is that right? Or did we maybe we went back once but it was basically just a couple days from what I remember. It's like I literally left Minneapolis on a Friday morning and barely got to the studio in time to get you know, just start setting up. So I drove seven and a half hours and then pulled right up into downtown Chicago, walked up the studio and just started setting up microphones. So there wasn't a whole lot of time to like talk about things or anything. It's like it was, we only had that Friday evening and then following Saturday and Sunday to kind of go through stuff and just get it to tape. I think we were like, you know, kind of stressed out. And the day we drove up to Chicago to go into the studio, Brett had a stop at a music store so he could buy new cymbals, like, which apparently had been on his mind for <laughs> some time. I mean, we were already in the studio and I had to be like, oh, okay, I, I gotta, and you know, luckily like a store, a guitar center, in Chicago had the two symbols that I was looking for. As excited as I was, I was also like, um, I guess riddled with anxiety. I was probably a proponent of that. I was like, I think it'd be a really great idea if we went to Guitar Center and just like not do this right now. More or less, the songs were recorded live, all the basic tracks. Um, there was, uh, you know, amps and different rooms and stuff. Uh, just for isolation of the audio, but uh, yeah, all the all the basic performances were live. Like the size of the room was really big, the live room, and it was a really kind of top notch like studio. Um, and so it was just awesome. It sounded just really fucking great. I mean, the course of the recording process. Uh, the, the more the more we tried to bring out of it, the more we realized just it was best left just left alone. Uh, instead of, what if we make it really big here? Anytime we dread, did that, it just felt wrong to everybody in the room. We were like, okay, well, what if we do this? It's it, it just like, it seemed like every move we made, it's like we knew more of what we didn't want than what we actually wanted. Except for the vocals, it was all so, uh, you know, we had it all planned out. Did you kind of know what you were going to do with vocals and words, or how was that handled? Yeah, that was last minute. I mean, for me, especially maybe, like I was just put off writing lyrics for Nosferatu Man and, and Donnie Man. And Donnie Man, we had never played, and that was pretty, like, it was pretty, it's pretty funny in retrospect, because it was, it was like, the time, like, people were just like, you know, man, like, Brett, seriously, like, this is fucked up, you know, like, because it was, like, you know, eating a lot of studio time. 
Yeah, it became very apparent to me over the course of the recording. Just like, I, like it was like this dialogue between Brit and Brian, but it seemed like Brian or Brit was the one that was that had the the the, the big picture in mind. I wasn't really aware of that until I guess when we started recording Don a Man. I'm like, oh wait a second. Just the, not the tone of the instrument, but the tone of the music itself. And you realize like, oh wait, this this guy is kind of the the guiding force behind it. Don stepped outside. And it's funny, it's like everybody assumes that Brian was the singer, but it's like, Brit, on the record, it's like Brit's doing like half the vocals on that. We had one, one microphone that was set up for like the louder stuff, and the other stuff was for the more intimate stuff. Um, we, I remember we pulled out this old like RCA ribbon mic, and the people at the studio kind of like laughed at me, like, nobody's used that in like 20 years, what are you doing? We have these great microphones over here, they're brand new, you probably don't want to use that. But of course, it's like those guys saw that, and they're like, we, we want to use that thing. The vocals were recorded so fast. I mean, maybe two passes or something at each song. A lot of the cool things that happened in that recording, I think, were, were just sort of improvised. Like, there's some backing vocals on Breadcrumb Trail that are really mixed in really quietly. Who is doing the backing vocals? Like, what is that? Um, maybe just Brian and Todd and Dave. And, I mean, I, no, I did it too. Just like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of that stuff probably did happen at three or four in the morning because like, we were literally working until we would drop. And I mean, that I, I think most of the time by the time we leave the studio, the sun was coming up. I knew the lyrics to Good Morning Captain just from the four track stuff that Brian had played for us. And, uh, uh, but there was, there was a little, there's a spoken word part right before the, the big ending, the I miss you part that he, he was just sort of improvising at the time, and um, he was trying to he was trying to build up to that part, and he was trying out different things in the studio. I'm trying to find my way home. I'm sorry. I miss you. like he had a light just like right above him but there was it was dark all around him. when he did the I'm sorry part it was he wasn't sure if he wanted to keep it or not and wanted to go back and, and redo it but I think all of us in the studio were just like you know we're in the control room we're just like you have to keep that yeah yeah man he was like dripping wet I guess sorry I can't hear what was that uh, dripping wet like how, I don't understand what you mean. Well, he was like sweat, sweating and just really, you know, like, I don't know. He might have like gotten sick or something, like puked or something like Soon after the recording of Spiderland, Brian checked himself into a hospital. 
the band Slint would never enter a recording studio again. Despite the high regard that Spiderland would eventually find, the band were initially unsure about the recording session's results. I'm sure they had done it a dozen times better than that in, in rehearsal. But, um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, well, I mean, it's like, it's, it's a lot to digest, especially with something that you've only been able to spend a short amount of time on in the execution of when you spent a long amount of time in preparation of, I'm sure it took them forever to come to terms with the fact that it was fine. I don't think I had any sense of, like, you know, um, like it being, like, uh, special in, like, a, the outside world or something. Like, my favorite records always get better as they go on. They don't, they don't start off strong and then get weaker. They always, um, they always sort of introduce you to their world and then get better by the end of the record. Um, and, and that, and I think that was the, the basic premise for the sequencing. Brian pretty much is the foresight of the band. I mean, as far as like, ch like deciding that Glenn and Pam that we recorded at the same session like would be better if they weren't on there. Like, that was his idea, and I was like, yeah, definitely. We had the idea of going to the quarry to take photos, and we took some other photos to in different locations, which just didn't really look like anything. Brian pretty much like had the good eye on that. I don't know, Brian had a, a lot of the ideas for uh, the, the name of the album was his idea. Slant yeah. Spiderland recorded August through October 90, 90, engineered by Brian Paulson Band, photo by Will Oldham, Spider Photo by Noel Saltzman, interested female vocalist, right, 1864 Douglas Boulevard, Louisville, Kentucky, 40205. <laughs> Were you surprised that the address of the house was going to be put on the record, and did that cause any? We, I didn't even know about it, but no, not really. It, it didn't really cause any problems. Dear Slint, I'm a girl of five, and my daddy says I will become a singer. Too good for Slint. I'm not interested. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's, awesome. That's awesome. Dr. Ill. Somebody told me that we probably had a letter from P.J. Harvey in there, and I never saw it. I don't. It may still be in the box for all I know. After the recording of Spiderland, we um, we were supposed to tour Europe. It already kind of blown up. Maybe. Um, and then I guess, yeah, Brian quit right around that time. I don't remember what was said exactly, but I, the thing I do remember is he talked to us for a long time, then he left, and I remember Brett and Dave just being like, what in the hell was he talking about? And I was like, man, he quit. <laughs> like it was bothering him that he was doing more of the, you know, like business and kind of taking more responsibility for the band that he felt wasn't shared and, uh, you know, like people being late to practice or um, stuff like that. And he said he just felt like he was putting more into it than he was getting out of it. Um, but it was hard to understand at the time. I think Brian felt his reasons so deeply that I, I don't think that I felt in a position to try to convince him that it could work, you know. I'm sure it was hard for him to quit, and uh, I don't know how much second guessing was or wasn't going on in his mind, but uh, uh, I think there was a lot going on in his mind and a lot that was hard for him to verbalize. I think given some of the, like, just truly sort of, sort of odd, organic way that you know the music had occurred in the past it seemed like it seemed that the potential for having more of a um, sort of required formal set of considerations for just like getting things done um, just it seemed likely that that would need to happen a and that b that with that group of people, it just wasn't appropriate. 
I know, like talking to Britt, we, we just didn't want to, we didn't think it'd be right to carry on without him. So um, we just decided not to go under the name Slint anymore. like I was walking around like yeah Slint's a band and I couldn't really accept or get it through my head that it wasn't like happening anymore or something. Anyhow we couldn't tour to we had there was which in retrospect maybe that added to the whole mystique you know. I saw Brian uh, right before I was going to college I guess he had a test pressing of uh, Spiderland yeah, I just remember kind of being totally, you know, mystified by it. My main memory is bringing a mix over to Steam's place and him hanging around for the first time. He's sort of like, what? What is this? It's like, oh, Brian, what are you doing? <laughs> My initial reaction to hearing Brian singing on Washer was that it wasn't that great of an idea. <laughs> and their, their initial impulse to, like, be an instrumental band was probably a, a better uh, expression of it. And I'm really glad I got over that. I'm really glad that, you know, I mean, I would, I would consider that, I would class that as listener error. That record became the soundtrack to my life at that moment. It was so different from, you know, most of the rest of what we were putting out and in, in a way that I just loved. The Midwest aesthetic was like tough and abrasive and it was just a tough vibe and a noisy vibe. And the slint thing was so vulnerable, but yet not, not twee in any way at all. At that moment, there was something zeitgeisty about that record in that it was this hypersensitive, gentle, thoughtful, complex, almost classical, better than dumb punk rock. And then you meet them and it's like, they were like, let's fucking make a punk rock record. Let's make like a weird, you know, like, let's, we're gonna make it kind of avant-garde. Like, there was nothing really above culture about them. They were just making their band. Like, the sound of that record just came to be some kind of an ideal to me. Like, it's such a, such a natural, neutral present, presentation of a band who totally has their shit together, you know? Uh, there are very few records that, are, that crystallize a perception like, like that one did. Spiderland came out when I wasn't in Louisville anymore. So I was in a record store and had, I don't know, I think I also bought Boredom's Soul Discharge or something. And then I see all their heads popping up out of the water and I think, oh my God, another Slint record, amazing. And, and buy it and put it on and, and it just seemed to have um, multiplied itself. You know, it's sort of, it was sort of like Slint cubed or something. I got into Slint like kind of at the very end and then it just like totally hit me and I, I was, I was like, I was super into it, and I just never like really even said much of anything. Like I might have called Brian one time and just said like, "Man, th this is really awesome. I, I don't think you understand. Like, I, I, I this is really great." And uh, he would just be like, "Yeah, that's cool." Like, yeah. What I love about those songs now is like, you can almost kind of experience them like paintings. Like, there's like depth and space in them, and they don't they don't take me on the same kind of linear trip that narrative songs do. And I think that's one reason I was ill-equipped to appreciate them is probably I'm a lot more of a traditionalist than I would like to admit, at least when it comes to songwriting. Touch and Go released Spiderland in March of 1991 in a small press run of several thousand copies. Because Slint had actually broken up before its release, there were no tours, no interviews, no music videos, and not much initial response from college radio. At the time, the chances of that being big on college radio weren't that great. I mean, we tried, but like it, it uh, if you look at what was going on, it wasn't like 
college radio was just waiting for this record. One of the only pieces of promotion that did exist was a positive record review written by Steve Albini that was published in a UK music magazine called The Melody Maker. Despite the band not being around to promote Spiderland, the album began to find an audience, selling more and more copies each year, almost entirely by word of mouth. I am pretty struck by how many people, like, check them, like how, what effect, like what an effect that band had. Like clockwork, it just kept selling, like every year it would tick over another couple thousand. And um, what, what that kind of a pattern indicates is that everybody who got that record kind of cherished it. Did you ever have people mail letters or knock on the door or anything? Letters, Tons are you kidding? Mail. Tons of fan, fan mail. Fan mail, I mean regularly, regularly from Sweden, China, it, you name it. I was always just amazed. I, I couldn't believe it because it was so many years, you know, since they had been together. Yeah. And then to continue to get all this mail, it was amazing. Almost immediately after breaking up as Slint, all four members would work with Will Oldham on the early Palace Brothers recordings. <laughs> The band actually briefly reformed in both 1992 and 1994, secretly working on some new material in a remote cabin in the woods before dissolving again. We had an idea that we really wanted to just go somewhere and, and like just be the, like the four of us. It wasn't regular rehearsal, we just went through a couple of spurts um, and we just worked on just really only a couple of you know, different ideas. What was it like? Was it kind of in any way similar to the previous stuff or completely different? Um, it was, it sounded, it was a, a little different. Um, it seemed like it was a little looser. It was fun and it was really like kind of this weird um, uh, period of, I don't want to say like, it would definitely be wrong to say euphoric, but it was this like sense like, oh my God, can could we do this and make money? And what would that mean? And like, how do we feel about that? And uh, what sort of music do we make now? And uh, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, a lot of stuff I think on our on our minds. <laughs> uh, uh, in that regard, and um, and ultimately, you know, I just think, like, just timing wasn't right. The members of Slint began to move away from Louisville. Britt turned up in Olympia, Washington, Seattle, and New York City. I got an apartment on B or C and 3rd Street, and he kind of took over my room. He was staying in my place and feeding my cat. Do you remember his baking job? Fuck! He baked sexy cakes, didn't he? What was the place called? It was called, uh... Oh... He... Oh... Master Bakers. Master Bakers! Shit! He baked penis cakes and tit cakes. I was like, what the fuck are you doing? You know? I was like, well, um, man, you know... I just thought it would be cool to come up to, uh to New York, you know, and just, like, learn how to bake, you know. <laughs> like, dude, I was like, you playing at all? No, no. He made penis cakes and did not play as Slint or as Evergreen or in The Breeders. He didn't do any of that. He made penis cakes and, and lived in my apartment with my cat. This guy who made decisions, I don't know what that matrix is like in there that makes those decisions. There was no passivity. He's not a passive guy. He was like, I really want to try dishwashing. I really want to bake erotic cakes. In the years following the release of Spiderland, you could occasionally find new releases popping up in record stores, where if you dug through the liner notes, you might realize that one of these guys had been involved, sometimes unattributed and sometimes under fake names. Brian formed a band called The Four Carnation and recorded several releases. 
David Paho performs under his own name, as well as the names M, Papa M, and Ariel M. He's also been a member of Tortoise, Royal Trucks, Stereo Lab, Dead Child, and The Four Carnation, and still tours regularly with other bands, including Interpol and the Yeah Yeah Yeahs. Todd Brashear went on to perform and record with Palace Brothers, Bonnie Prince Billy, and Rising Shotgun. He also opened a video store called Wild and Woolly in 1997. After leaving Slint, Ethan Buckler formed King Kong and was joined by the other members of Slint on early recordings. Britt might have the most complicated body of work outside of Slint. Like that band, The Breeders, that Britt has like everything to do with that, the way that that first album sounds and feels and stuff. And somehow like I, I was like, oh wait, the Slint guy's The Breeders? What, you know? And what, no, when now he's not? Like, what the, what the fuck is up with this guy? You know, like, like, like what is his deal? Prior to Spiderland, Britt had played drums and provided vocals for the Breeders' debut album Pod and the Safari EP. But it was under a series of fake names. When Kim was in Chicago doing a one-song session with the Pixies, that's when Britt met Kim. And I think they hit it off. I think they recognized that each, of, each was a little bit insane. Britt was really totally solid on that whole thing. I think he kind of backed into an appreciation for that music and that band. Moving Brit from Slint, which is fairly abstract music, into The Breeders, which is fairly linear, fairly straightforward music, gives you an idea of what differentiates Brit from a conventional drummer. Like, that he could adapt his kind of odd, but uh, sort of continuous drumming style into a band that was basically writing three chord pop songs, I think was kind of remarkable. Uh, but again, the, the crucial thing was that he wasn't like a guy who was ever trying to get attention. It was like people were always chasing him. At the time that the rock world was catching up with Spiderland, Britt was nowhere to be found on the indie rock circuit. Instead, he had devoted himself to playing with aging blues musicians, like Smoketown Red, Fred Murphy, and the B.B. Taylor Blues Band. They played regularly in after-hours motorcycle clubs, as well as a small diner called the Coffee Cup Cafe. Eventually, he joined the band Evergreen and turned up on recordings and live sessions for Bastro, Interplanetary Music Ensemble, Mighty Flashlight, Hogleg, Half Seas Over, Cat Power, King Kong, Sally Timms from the Mekons, and the Palace Brothers. Britt hasn't had a recording project in several years, but still keeps cassettes full of piano lines and guitar riffs and ideas for songs. Most of the stuff that I come up with, I. I mean, none of it I've have I done anything with. Like, it's kind of just been waiting for a band. Like, I've just kind of not found another, you know, idea for a way to, you know, create something from it. I mean, I feel really fortunate just to have been able to, like, have been a part of, like, the band and, and just to do it. I don't really have uh, <laughs> much access to the sort of, like, mystique or whatever. Yeah, for all the mystique that surrounds the band and how seriously everybody takes it and stuff, Really, we all had a pretty good time, I would say, most of the time. Like, I think people would be surprised how much time we spent goofing off and laughing and being idiots or whatever. Yeah, it was cool just how, um, like, you know, just how, like, I guess comfortable with each other we were. I don't know, that was the best part of slant i thought was the collaborating because we could all get along so well and you know musically just understood each other i thought and yeah that's my favorite thing about you know playing music
you know, just like saying anything just that came out of our mouths, you know. Yeah.